this uh, beautiful edition of list catchers. It's also uh, a very special day for our hosts and sponsors, Odyssey. It's their uh, 24th birthday, complete 24 years. They en they're entering their 25th year. I saw Ashwin, uh, the, 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 the force behind ODC, somewhere downstairs, he's joining us in a bit. But without ODC's help, we cannot be putting together these um, conversations for uh, audiences repeatedly, month on month, for the last five years. So uh, thank you, ODC team, ODC, all of you who are here. There's my young friend, uh, Nijandan, who does all the creative work that you see here. Uh, it's all coordinated by him. So thank you, Team ODC, for being so compassionate, so supportive, and for Ashwin for leading it uh, and making this a very special place in Chennai for us to come and hang out. Uh, some, some of you are new in the audience, so I will take a few minutes to quickly introduce uh, ourselves and also the uh, program, this, this show, The Best Catchers. So that's Vani over there at the, uh, the far end, uh, and me, uh, Avis, we are the Happiness Walas, and um, it's our life's purpose to inspire happiness. We are uh, dealing with a very, very challenging phase in our life for the last uh, decade and a little more than that. Uh, but in this phase, when we have been dealing with a bankruptcy, we have discovered that no matter what circumstances we are faced with in life, we always have the option, each of us has the option to be happy despite our circumstances. And we thought, why not share what we have learned with uh, people around us? So uh, I first started with just putting out this book, Fall Like a Rose Petal, which came out in 2014. and. Uh, in this book, I talk about our journey from fear, when you put no money, when you have no work, and you're dealing with complete darkness, you are gripped by fear, you are held hostage by fear. So I talk about our journey from fear to happiness, how we learned to be uh, non-worrying, non-frustrated and non-suffering. One thing led to another, we started delivering talks, we started uh, talking about uh, our experiences through my blog, uh, which I write every day where I share uh, learning with um, uh, people that want to pause and reflect. Uh, I share a learning every day. Uh, we uh, do workshops on uh, happiness at the workplace. How can we be inspired to live a life of resilience, of reflection and resourcefulness? Uh, in, in our workplaces so that we can be more productive. We talk about that. And of course, uh, we do life coaching for whoever reaches out to us. And over the last uh, five years, we've been curating live, reflective, non-commercial conversations. Bliss Catchers is one of them. This is our longest running series. And the Bliss Catchers series uh, celebrates the idea that we live one life and we got to live this happily. Therefore, let's go out and do what we love doing. It is uh, inspired by uh, American mythologist and author uh, Joseph Campbell's philosophy of follow your bliss. So Campbell said, follow your bliss. Don't be scared. Uh, don't feel that you are going to be subjected to insecurity and fear. He said, let go, follow your bliss, and doors will open. And we take you forward in the direction of what you love doing, connecting you to people, connecting you to situations that are extremely suited for making you come alive and live a very fulfilled, complete life. So in this series, The Bliss Catchers, we explore the lived experiences of our guests and in a way, we also do uh, talk to our guests uh, who are living very magical lives. Uh, they are living lives which uh, only they can relate to from where they started. They have either quit their jobs and are doing something very, very different in life. 
or they have had the courage to go and do what they love doing without necessarily having to take up a job in the conventional sense. So they are not in the earning a living space, they are living fully. That is the beauty of each of these conversations that we have been having. This is the 48th uh, in this series, the 48th edition of Miss Catchers is what we are hosting uh, this evening. I'm reminded of uh, Rumi, who said, uh, don't be satisfied with the stories of others. Don't be satisfied with the stories of others, of how things have gone with others. Unfold your myth. That's what our bliss catchers do. Uh, they, they, they're not satisfied with the lives that, that people around them are living. They say, hey, how can I live a more meaningful life? fulfilling life. So let me give you an example of uh, one of our bliss catchers, uh, Santosh Subramanian. You, some of you might remember meeting him. He was in the second season, uh, September 2016 edition of bliss catchers. Uh, after IIT Kharagpur, he decided not to take a corporate job and decided to set up an online toy library called Bumper. Bumbaram makes board games for children. And later he found that corporates, people in, uh, in, 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 in general walks of life who are interested in board games wanted to uh, reach out to him. And he started making board games for everyone. Today, he is, in his own words, living a full life. And yet he says, one's cup can never be full. I'm reminded of his journey today because just yesterday I saw on his Facebook uh, timeline that this June he's going to New York to deliver a talk at the International Children's Game Festival uh, in June. And this journey for an IIT Kharagpur uh, graduate would not have been possible if he had not stepped out of, of the predictable path gone on to do what he loved doing, which is create something new for uh, the world, which is board games. And that's what he's going to talk about. So this is what we explore, the lived experiences of our guests. What prompted them to go in the direction of their bliss? What opportunities and challenges did they encounter? And how did they meet them and overcome them and move on? Today we have uh, two fascinating guests, uh, Arti, the artist, and uh, Nyaneshwar, the conservation enthusiast. And I'm going to introduce both of them the way I know them. Uh, both of them have very, very exciting stories and I can't wait to start exploring them. Uh, Arti came into contact with us through Bani, uh, who uh, has a deep interest in art herself. So uh, she has been following Arti for some time. On Instagram and tour, and um, uh, Bani also attended a couple of workshops of RT. And so I kind of knew that there was this person called Arti who ran the color company, who has a very strong Instagram following, and who makes uh, interesting stuff, uh, artistic stuff. Really, that's that's all I knew. One day, Bani came to me and she said, "Dad, you know what? Uh, I met Arti." And Arti had this uh, corporate job that she's quit, and uh, that's how she set up Color Company. And that's when my bliss catcher instinct stood up. I said, Hey, she quit a corporate job in what? So Arti said, HR. She quit a HR corporate job to be in art. Wow, that's a bliss catcher story. So when are we meeting her? And so we sat down and had coffee with. And we discovered that she has a engineering background. That's quite pretty. Right? Uh, I think many people say that they do engineering so that they can figure out what they want to do with their life. Okay? Many people who have come here have said this. So uh, she has an engineering background that went on to do uh, an MBA in HR from XLRI. Uh, had a very comfortable, meaningful corporate stint for about a decade. And then she sets up the color company. Now, why, why did she do that? 
she told us that she was once immobilized during a diving trip in the Andamans where uh, she, uh, a school of jellyfish uh, attacked her and her husband and in that time is when she realized that she needed to follow up this art. And the color company today uh, does uh, specialized artwork projects for customers and she also holds workshops uh, in various forms of art, particularly the one that Vani goes to is called the Kupash. Is that the way to pronounce it? Uh, so uh, she, uh, she leads the Kupash workshops as well. And she says that art defines, that's what art means to art. So thank you Arti for joining us and we, you know, we are so happy to have you here. And then we go to our next bliss catcher who is, by the way, for the record, the youngest bliss catcher ever on this platform. He's all of 21 and that's Nyaneshwar. How did we find Nyaneshwar? We found Nyaneshwar in the audience here. Last year, the fourth season of Bliss Catchers, we had uh, Surya Ramachandran, uh, a naturalist guy, uh, who again did engineering and went on to uh, follow his bliss, uh, talking to me. And when we finished the conversation, uh, Yanishwar walked up and uh, we got talking. And I found in him a conviction. In just that, those few minutes, I found in him a rare conviction. The way he shook hands with me, the way he looked in my eye, the way he talked proudly about the work he was doing at Madras Crop Bank. Uh, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand how we can control instances of uh, snakes being killed, right, uh, by human beings. And he said uh, that, that disturbs him a lot. So in that little interaction, there was a spark. And so we invited him for uh, coffee. And uh, we wanted to understand, who's this guy? What's this kid really up to? And we found that when he was just 13 years old, a snake had crept into their home in Vizag. And uh, the watchman had killed that snake, an incident that deeply disturbed Yanishu. And that led him to aspire to be a conservation enthusiast. These words are very important, why he calls himself a conservation enthusiast. He went on to study uh, wildlife biology and uh, he was uh, eventually absorbed at the Madras Crop Bank where, where he's currently working. His vision is to be in wildlife uh, crime control. And he says he's not in a rush to become something. He's very happy partnering in conservation efforts for the rest of his life. And that's why he, he prefers calling himself a conservation enthusiast. You know, the word enthusiasm is a beautiful word, Yanisha. Enthusiasm comes from the Greek word. Uh, it has Greek roots. En, theos. En means within. And theos means God. So the God within is what makes us enthusiastic. And so if you are a conservation enthusiast, it's the God within you that speaks. And when your God within you speaks, then the whole world listens. That's magic. That's the point where this happens. And so I'm here to explore how the God within uh, Yaneshwar speaks and the God within Arti speaks. And that's um, what today's conversation is all about. We are all set for it. May I now invite Arti and Yaneshwar to join me here. Please join us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Please pick up your mics and turn them on. Okay, so we are all set. I hope you both are comfortable. Yeah, it's a bit warm, but at least I'm feeling warm. But uh, that's also the warmth of the Bliss Catcher community. Um, for all of you who are new and uh, the first time at Bliss Catchers, just uh, a quick uh, word of the, of the of way the structure is. Uh, we will take this conversation all 
the way to uh, between three of us till to about 8.20 p.m. Uh, we have two quiz segments. Uh, the quiz segments are when I ask you questions about my guests. And so we have two segments today, with one happening around 7.45 p.m., which is about half an hour from now. Uh, we will ask you questions about each of the guests, and the right answer wins you this beautiful Miss Catcher mug. Okay? Then at about 8.15, 8.20, we ask you two more questions on our guests, and you get to win two more marks, so totally four marks. And then we have something very special today. We have two extra questions, which means two extra marks. Why do we have two extra questions? Because it's the 24th birthday of Odyssey. So we're celebrating the 24th birthday of Odyssey with two additional quest quiz questions. So totally six mugs going to you to this evening. And when we finish the second quiz segment, uh, I'll do a quick wrap and we will, by this clock that I have in front of me, wrap up this session at 8.29 p.m. Uh, so please stay with us all the way till the end, win your mugs, and uh, to uh, enjoy this conversation. Okay, so let's get started. Thank you. All set? Yes. We'll start with the lady first? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Arti, uh, I, I want to start by asking you a very reflective question. What makes you believe when you sit today where you are on, on the Biscayne chair uh, and think back at your life? What makes you believe that you were always meant to be an artist? Um, so I think my earliest memory of art um, goes back to school. Um, so I, I used to visit this store called Hindustan Stationery. Um, and I was so drawn to that store for, you know, some unknown reason. Uh, it was amazing how a little store like that could hold so much. Uh, and at that point in time, I'm not really sure whether I wanted to be an artist, but I wanted to do something related to color and art. Um, so I was, um, I always wanted to own a store like Hindustan. So you wanted to own a store? Wow. Yeah, like, like that. Um, so I think that's that's the earliest memory I have of you know my fascination for something art related, um, and I think uh, like in most stories, I think family plays a very very important role in in nurturing you know your your interest. Um, so I remember I once uh, scribbled the drawing of a cat as a, as a very young child. So it was basically two circles and two triangles and one tail on a piece of marble. So I, you know, drawn on it with a marker. And um, many, many years later, I visited my uncle's house. He, he shifted overseas. And to my surprise, uh, this little drawing of the cat on the marble was uh, in his showcase. It was framed and kept there. And I, I still remember how that that feeling hit me, you know. That was the first time something that I did was displayed somewhere. And, and uh, you know, the, the sense of joy that I derived from seeing something that I created, being in someone's home, I think, uh, you know, that, that really sparked a sense of joy in me. So that's, uh, I think I think that's when my my journey with art began, knowingly, unknowingly. That, that's how it was, you know, seeded in, in my life. So one was uh, about you imagining that you would own a store like the Hindustan Art Store. Yes. And the second is a reaffirmation that you receive uh, from the universe because somebody could have discarded that, that piece of uh, childish art. Yeah. Right? But your uncle actually preserved it. Yes. And what are the chances that you would visit your uncle and actually see, see it, it there? Right? Absolutely. So yeah. he could have just preserved it, it could have gone into his collection into his archives and not be on, on a manual piece. Right. So that's that's uh, that's where I'm taking away a very important learning. In a way, all of us have early influences of what we are today. There have been early influences. And we have a lot of early influences, but some of them 
have a way of creeping back into our life. They slip back into our life and stand up and say, you know, we met before. I, this past uh, fortnight, for, 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 a, for, a, for a very uh, important reason, I have been reflecting on my own childhood. And I, I realized that when I was a couple of years old, I, I, I'm told that I used to tell the story of the Guruayu Temple. And I used to tell the story of the Life Insurance Corporation building and say that LIC stands for Life Insurance Corporation. So I actually went to Google and I said, this can't be true. How could I have, I'm, I'm a 1967 born. So how could I have gone and told the story of Life Insurance Corporation in 1967? And there's a bit of trivia about, about Life Insurance Corporation building on Mount Road. It was inaugurated in 1959. And when it was inaugurated, it was the tallest building in India. So no wonder my, my father taught me what LIC stood for. And so, in a way, I think when I connect the dots back, I believe that I was always meant to tell stories. I was always meant to express myself through the spoken word and through the written word. And that's what I'm doing today. So there is a way our early influences come back into our lives. And it's a beautiful uh, reminder that the universe has a fascinating plan for us. Sometimes we don't know it. We can't. We, we can't understand it, we can't hold it, we can't wrap our hands around it, but it is there. That's what I picked out from your story. Thank you for sharing that. So let me ask you, I'm sure you, you thought about this question as well. So my next question is, uh, the other day when we were having coffee at Starbucks, you told us that you uh, wanted to uh, do this cup uh, after your 12. And you even had an admission at NOP uh, College, which was just starting up at that time. Perhaps you were the, you would have been the first batch or whatever. But you ended up taking engineering at SSN, and then you go to uh, XLRI for your MBA in HR, and then you have like a DPA in corporate HR life. All of that happens. But sitting here and reflecting now, do you feel that we all have a way of stumbling around with our life a little bit before we understand? Hey, this is not what I want to do, but this is what I want. Is that is that uh, is that a revelation that happens much later in life? Is that has that been your experience as well? Yeah. Uh, so for me, it's it's always been that way. Um, I've always learned from from incidents, experiences. So uh, and and you know also, I think as uh, in India, when at least back then, you know when you when you pass out of class twelve. Uh, there's very little that, uh, you know, at that point in time, there were very few options. Everybody at home, including myself, wanted the safe path out. And engineering is like almost like it's an extension of school. So that was a very natural, uh, you know, choice to pick. Uh, but, you know, having said that, I have absolutely no regrets in my education uh, journey because every, every aspect of uh, of the years that I've spent either in engineering or in MBA is definitely helping me uh, in a great way today. Although I do nothing related to uh, what I study, little aspects of engineering, little aspects of being taught management formally help me a great deal today. So while um, you know, while it may not uh, it may not directly link into what me and my company do today. Uh, I, I definitely believe that those influences hold me in very good stead. So, um, and personally, I, my my life journey has always been that way. Whether you know, whether it was for personal learning or whether it's for you know, uh, jobs and other commercial activities, I've always drawn in on experiences from the past, and that's just how my life has been. So, I believe that's a very integral part of a person growing up and understanding and discovering about oneself. So I've just blossomed that way. I like I like that word. I've just blossomed that way. So there, there's a there's a very valuable takeaway there. You know, there are no right ways or wrong ways in life. Each experience that presents itself to us is an opportunity to learn and blossom from, if I can borrow that word. Uh, and nothing is ever a waste. 
it kind of adds up somewhere in, in its own way. But in a very special way, when you do something and you begin to like doing it, then you want to do it again and again. And if you don't like doing it, then you at least realize that this is not what I want to do. Therefore, that experience is again helping you decide what which direction to take. And I don't think any of us can go back and undo what happened in our lives. So you can't undo your engineering part, you can't undo your XLRI part and say, I wish I could just be that kid again and uh, set up that Hindustan art store straight away after class 12. You can't do that. But there is a value that each experience brings to the table. And that's what I'm picking up from. Uh, from your uh, from your answer there. so thank you thank you for sharing that in in my in my story in my life what what happened was i was working with a uh, big takeover tycoon a man known for uh, his mega corporate deals a man who was very well known in this part of india uh, a man called sivasankar i was his executive assistant and uh, uh, i was all of 20 Seven when I was working with him as his executive assistant. And there's one lesson that I learned from him, which is that money is not everything in life. Because for him, it was only money, and it is still only money. And I realized I'm not that person. That lesson helped me later deal with a huge loss when we went bankrupt as a firm and penniless as a family. I realized that that experience working with Sivasankar, that taught me that money is not everything in life, also helped me cope with the fact that we ourselves were penniless now. So there was no grief over it. There was cluelessness on how to deal with it, but there was no grief over the loss. There was no suffering in that sense. And so every experience is, is very, very valuable. So I'm glad you're looking at it that way. I love the word you used, um, loss. I wish everyone takes away that word, that every experience helps you blossom to reach the stage where you are today, right? Um, I'm going to ask uh, Yaneshwar my next question and come back, because we have to get to a very, very interesting part of Arti's story, and that will be a longer exploration, so I don't want to keep uh, young Yaneshwar's story waiting there. I'm going to keep using the word young, okay? So please bear with me. Uh, you are young. You are young. Um, the only difference is at your age, I had already proposed to Vani. <laughs> and, uh, we were we were looking forward to having our, our baby, uh, Ashirwa. So uh, I moved a little fast there. I don't know your story yet, but uh, we'll talk about it a little later. But let me first go to the 13-year-old uh, Nyaneshwar, who saw a snake being killed at home. Okay? Have you ever, probably over a glass of beer, maybe just looking at the skies, have you ever tried to rationally uh, examine why is it that you got so deeply affected by a snake being killed? I think it's natural human behavior uh, and perhaps even instinct to kill a snake if you see a snake intrude into your space, right? But you behaved in the possibly opposite way where you felt deeply affected by it. So have you tried to rationally analyze it? So go back to that day, that night, or that, that part of your life, and tell us what all happened, and why do you think you behaved that way? So uh, it was during my 10th board exams, and I was going for my math tuition. So I was going for math tuition, and uh, suddenly, when I was about to put my shoes, I saw something moving right in front of me, and I was thinking, what was this, a big lizard or something? And then... I moved a shoe and there was a snake. It was just crawling against the wall and, and had to hide away from me. So it went in and stayed in one more shoe rack. So at that time, our, our home was being built. So we are at a rented house. So I quickly went and I called my mom telling that, see mom, there's a snake out here. So please call uncle and get a stick that I can use it to lift it and to pick it somewhere else. So my mom conveyed the same, but they didn't receive the message well. So they brought in a watchman and uh, they killed the snake in front of me. So uh, that was, I was never so emotional, I guess, but after they did that, I started crying on the road 
I was a little bit embarrassed because a cute girl in the street was looking at me. So I just went there and I went into my room and then I slept on the bed. I started crying. All my uncles came and started to console me and they were telling me, hey man, this is not a big thing. There is a snake, nothing will happen. And I was trying to explain them that, see, this snake is not venomous. It's a rat snake. It's a harmless snake that is just venturing into our taste because we have lots of rats. And then, but they couldn't understand either. I was in, about, about to like completely tell them what it means. So yeah, I kept crying for a day, a half a day, and I was a little bit upset. And then um, later that evening, I stopped talking to everybody at my home. And the next day, I somehow my father was able to talk to me, and he asked me like, "Hey, this is okay. Don't worry much about it. Uh, like, uh, don't worry much. Stop uh, putting stress on you. You have an exam day after tomorrow." And then uh, I arrogantly told him, "See, I don't care about exams. I, I sh you should we shouldn't have killed that snake, and uh, I'm gonna do something about it." He said, "Okay, don't mind." Within half an hour, I went to an internet shop right next to my home. I started googling for snake pit. So I started searching results for people from Noida, people from Ahmedabad, with people who supply snake rescue equipment, who can, through which we can safely remove a snake and put it somewhere else. So I found this guy from somewhere in Noida, Delhi, and uh, quickly he took some change from my father and I went to a STD and started calling him and asking, troubling him with my broken Hindi. And then finally, somehow, he told that, uh, okay, I can deliver you a snake by a snake. Uh, rescue kit and then uh, we'll do something about it. At this moment I was very scared because okay I was supposed to be studying but I did this so if I tell this to my father he'll be scolding me so I was thinking and I was still very upset about the incident from the evening so somehow I went and I told my father in a very low voice that uh, see I did this can you help me in buying this and him without saying anything man who always says that why but he just said that day that, okay, sure, no problem, go ahead. And I was so surprised, I was so rejoiced, and I could study properly that night. But uh, I always go back to that moment whenever I'm a little bit upset about how that thing was uh, a major turn back for me. Because I never knew, I never knew that I would be so emotionally or so attached to something that happened that I so yeah, it's, it's 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 something that. Are you able to rationally explain it even now? Yeah, very much because that that's I can I can envision it actually. I know that day, uh, what the, the name of the watchman, the face of him coming and feeling it, and me the snake, the shoes I was about to wear. Do you remember how you felt? Uh, yeah, it's, it was pretty depressing because they backed it right in front of me. When I was about to take a stick to lift it, they just killed it in front of me. So it was I just ran right. I just threw the stick, ran into the room directly into my room and fell on bed and started crying. And you started crying? Yeah. So that, that's, uh, that's a very powerful narrative. Uh, I can vividly uh, picture your, your emotional outburst with the way you narrated it. So thank you for sharing it so vividly for, uh, for us here. You know, what I have discovered is there are only a few times in life that you will feel emotionally stirred by what's happening to you or around you. <coughs> Many people wonder, and this is a question that will come to all of us at different times in our life, why are we here? Why are we here on this planet? If you have not asked yourself this question, it's a good time to ask yourself this question. All of us have been created in this human form. We didn't ask to be created. We have been created. So there is a reason for it. In the French language, they say raison d'être, reason for existence. <coughs> Excuse me. In Japanese, they say ikigai, reason for being. The reason why you are a human being. But there is a reason. And that reason is not about making money. That reason is not about fame and glory. That reason is about being happy. That reason is about being useful to the world around you. That reason will find you when you are loving, when you are compassionate, when you are allowing yourself to be led by life. So reaction one, which perhaps somebody may have indulged in a 
but the snake is hit, ah, good riddance. That's reaction one. Because you don't feel for that species, you're not compassionate, all you're, all you're seeing is that it was an intrusion in your personal space and therefore good riddance. That's reaction one. Reaction two is to run, fall on the bed and cry because you, you empathize with the helplessness of that species. You are connecting somewhere with the universe's creative energies. And that's when your purpose finds you. So the reason there, or reason for existence, the ikigai, reason for your being, is your life's purpose. That purpose finds you on its own. If you are not only living in the earning a living bubble, but you are also living in the living and loving bubble. That's why I think you, you found yourself. You were too young to process it that way. But hearing your story, that's the way I process it. But tell me a little bit about why somebody like you, after that episode, you were still talking about uh, uh, going to medical school, right? Uh, typically, uh, it's like, like she leans in the direction of engineering uh, because the families normally say that's more safe. Like that perhaps you were leaning uh, towards medicine. But then you eventually go on to do a very unique, unheard of program called wildlife biology. Uh, how did that happen? Why were you leaning in the direction of medical school and how did the switch happen? So the reason why I opted a medical school was because it has biology. And I really wanted to do that. But the problem was that everybody who does biology has to become a doctor. So I wanted to break that chain. And I wanted to go there and tell them that, see, biology doesn't mean you have to become a doctor. There is multiple things that I can pick up. So during my, after my 10th standard, uh, I started exploring avenues where I can involve myself into lots of uh, wildlife-based volunteering at all. And then one day I went to Bangalore to meet my sister. And then uh, somehow I googled for areas. I, I rescued a kite and I gave it in a zoo. They told me that they have some volunteering programs opening there around the zoo and a place inside, a rescue center inside a zoo. Then I tried to apply for it, but I couldn't get through. Later on, through some other mutual contacts I had, I could meet the veterinarian there and he introduced How old were you then? I was probably uh, <laughs> <laughs> 15. Yeah. So this was after the snake episode. 14, yeah, 14. Yeah. It was after the snake yeah. episode. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. so. Uh, so then uh, I went uh, to a wildlife rescue center in Bangalore called as Wildlife SOS and I started volunteering for bears. So it's about the bear rescue center. Then I just went there and the first thing they asked me to do is paint grills of a enclosure. I was a little bit surprised because I wanted to handle the animals and all. Okay, I said, okay, no problem. Then I again went second day. I did that same thing again. Third day, they gave me an interesting task of sandpapering the whole wall. I went again, no mind. Fourth day I was a little bit hesitant because it's too far from where I was living in Bangalore. And I had to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, catch a bus at 6 o'clock, walk at least 2 kilometers to go to the place. So I kept going for 4 days, 5 days, nothing changed, same volunteering program. But on the 6th day, I happened to meet this really cool person who was telling that I like your work, why don't you apply for this course in OT about a bachelor's in wildlife biology. And that was the moment when I got stuck to that idea, like, oh, yeah, why shouldn't I not do this? But that was the same day I had to leave because I had to go back home and start my college again. So I came back to the same place next year again, and I tried to meet the same person, but I couldn't meet him. But I got a message through him that there is a college in OT called as Government Arts College. You should go for it. And then same volunteering job again there and came back and Googled for it. I couldn't find it because it was not a website that was existing. Then I was a little bit uh, feeling low and at the same time there was a conference happening in Pune about snake bites. So I, I really wanted to go there again and then I thought I couldn't do it because of budget issues. And then where I went and asked my father if he can give me 9000 rupees and uh, I can go to Pune. At that time he used to earn 15,000 a month. So asking that huge amount was a big thing for me. And again, he at that time, he and my mom, both of them were okay to give me that money and send me to uh, Pune. And I was like surprised, like, why is this happening? Uh, what's that thing that they make me, they believe in me so much? 
and then I went to Pune, and when I was traveling to Pune, I met one more mutual friend of mine, and he told that, hey, I know this Uti College. Why don't I help you in giving you a recommendation and getting you admitted into it? Wow. And I was like, how is this happening? Like, I, I just going there everywhere, and then people are just telling me, you can do this, you can do that. I'll help you out. I'll help you out. And then just a lot of luck and a lot of good people around who are helping me. And then I came back from Pune. I got the admission, and after two years, after my second year of my inter, I joined. I went directly to Uti. I packed my tent. I, I knew that I will not get a room, so I packed my tent. I went with my brother. I applied for the college, and I stayed back that night. I don't know where. I don't know even remember where I stayed that night. And next day again, I came back to Bangalore. And then I went back to home. Ah, beautiful, amazing. I don't know why all this is happening to me. This is a very, very important point in his reply. I don't know why all this is happening to me. When you follow your bliss, says Campbell, doors will open. You put yourself on a track where, which was there for you all the time. It is waiting for you. And when you come on the track, then the right people, the right events, the right opportunities connect. What are the chances that on the sixth day at the Bear uh, Rescue Center, the man will tell you, the gentleman will tell you, hey, go to Uti. What are the chances that a father who's earning 15,000 rupees salary will spend 9,000 rupees on a son's snake bite conference? What are the chances that while on that uh, trip to Pune, somebody will tell you, why don't you go to Uti? What are the chances that you will go to Uti, pitch a tent, apply and get admission. It was part of your journey of following your bliss. So why does it happen to you? Only because you decided to move in that direction. And this is so true. Our, our stories may change, our context may change, but the uh, method with which the universe works, the process remains the same. That's what I'm picking up from you. The other thing I'm picking up from your story isn't it amazing that you have such fabulous parents? Yes, very, very much. Right? It's not, you know, go oh, study in engineering school or medical school because it's a safe option. Instead of that, your dad buys you a snake rescue kit. Your dad supports your journey to Pune to attend a snake bite conference. Isn't it amazing? So that's another thing. I think that's a message for all parents out there that allow your children to follow their bliss. You'll create a happier world rather than a wealthier world which is very unhappy. That's what happens when people end up having to do things which they don't like. Amazing, thank you. It's, this is getting very, very interesting, this conversation. Uh, he also has got a very meaty part and we're going to come to that pretty soon. Uh, but uh, and I, I need to go to uh, Aarti, but before all of that, I made a promise to you, so our first quiz segment comes up. So are you all ready? Okay, two, uh, so, Regulars, Ramesh, Geeta, please hold on. Please do not give the answer. Uh, and the families, any person representing either Aarti or Nyaneshwar, the family, if you're a family member, do not answer this question. Okay? Anybody else can answer. Uh, so the first question is on uh, Aarti. Okay? That's, the, uh, that's the first question. It's a simple one. Listen to me carefully. Connect Aarti Sivaramakrishnan to Jamshedpur. Excellent. Excellent. I absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, it was a simple one. I knew uh, somebody will get that answer very quickly. Please come forward. I, I, I forgot your name. Joel. Joel, yes. Thank you. This is, you have to handle it. Sorry. I, I seem to be doing it. Thank you. Yes. Okay, this one. Uh, is on Nyaneshwar. This question is on Nyaneshwar. Um, please connect uh, Nyaneshwar to two forthcoming games in the IPL. I need a complete answer. Please connect Nyaneshwar to two forthcoming games in the IPL. He knows the answer, but you can't answer. <laughs> Clue, clue, you need a clue? Quick one. So the clue is, uh, where did he find the snake? Where is that? Yeah, that's the, that is the answer, but connect. 
So two games are being shifted from Chennai to Vizag. Absolutely right. Yes, so MC gets it. Yes, the eliminator and the qualifier two, two of the games are moving from Chennai to Vizag. Yes, MC. So MC and uh, Geeta here are uh, the first family of uh, miscatchers. <laughs> Uh, and they have a fabulous collection of mugs, <laughs> miscatcher mugs in their home. They win a lot of mugs, uh, so you know someday we we're going to see a whole rack. Oh, you tend to give it. Let me, let me, bliss yes, and let's spread the, let's spread the message. I right? wrote it. Yes, absolutely, wonderful. So two mugs have gone away. We still have four mugs coming your way. Please wait until uh, eight fifteen, which is when the, those questions will come. So let's continue with your story. So we come to a very interesting part of Arti's uh, story here. Arti, talk to us about that diving trip. Why do you think that diving trip in Andamans when you get stuck in that hot in that school of jellyfish and you're you're immobilized by the sting of the jellyfish? Uh, talk to us about that time and why do you believe that was a turning point in you? Well. Um, my husband and I, we went to the Andamans to uh, do a certification course on uh, to, to be um, scuba divers. Um, so this was a five-day course and uh, day one and two went, went very well. Uh, we got to see a lot of lovely marine life and all of that. So day three, um, we, uh, uh, we were on a boat and we uh, sailed about 30 minutes away from the shore to dive at slightly deeper spots. So that's how the, the, the diving course progresses. And uh, we were about halfway through uh, uh, one of our exercises. So you have to keep completing exercises till you get the certification. So we were completing one of our exercises and we were heading back to the boat. So at that point in time, our, uh, our instructor, um, he said, hey, look out, you know, go underwater. And for a minute we were confused because we had kind of finished our exercise and we were going back to the boat. And uh, he said, there's a huge school of jellyfish coming, watch out. And you know, as w when you hear the word jellyfish, like, you know, when you hear the word snake, you're terrified. So when you hear the word jellyfish, you know, it, it it's a little terrifying because uh, people know how beautiful jellyfish looks. Uh, uh, you know, you also hear about how they how some, some stings are fatal. So there are all kinds of you know thoughts going through your mind. And uh, uh, we went underwater, but the school was so huge, you know, uh, it, it was a really tall school of fish that was uh, coming against us. Uh, and I remember feeling absolutely helpless, you know. Uh, we were in the middle of the ocean and uh, there was no way to sail back to shore quickly because it was a good 30 minutes out. And uh, at that point in time, I the word that keeps coming back to me is helpless. So helpless against helpless against nature, basically. And uh, when it when when the first sting came, so we were caught in a school, right? And they were swimming against us, and there was just no way. You just had to succumb to it, you, you know. There was no way you could swim against it. You couldn't outswim it either. So, uh, and, and that really put into perspective how small human beings are in the larger scheme of things. Uh, but, so we were just there. We just had to let the school pass through us. My husband and I were there and the instructor was also there. So when the first sting landed uh, on my leg, uh, that's when the fear set. And in that fear, and at that point in time, I thought it was going to die because, you know, jellyfish and such a huge school and it's stinging me and we're 30 minutes out, I'll not get to land before we reach a hospital, all of that. Um, at that point in time, I, I thought about a couple of things. And my work and my job and my salary was not one of them, you know. And it was so ironical because you spend 12 hours, 14 hours a day doing your your job and when it comes to I mean at that point in time I thought I was going to die so when it comes to a situation where you think you're facing death it's not even in your radar you know it's it's so ironical you spend you spend 90% of you know your day 
uh, thinking about work, even if you're not doing work, you're answering calls, you're replying to emails, you're, you know, uh, that, that's what consumes you through the day. And when it comes to what I thought was the final moment, it, you don't even think about it. So um, that was a, I mean, in hindsight now, that's a big realization. But at that point in time, I thought about family, I thought about, I, I kept thinking about how they would know this happened, you know. If I were gone, how would they know? And, you know, all those kinds of thoughts. And for one fleeting second, I thought about art. You know, I, I thought about what could have been. I was like, oh my God, my art. Those were the exact words that struck me. So there was this, and just for a second, you know, all of this, this happened fairly quickly, but that, that stayed with me. And uh, after something big like that happens, uh, I feel like a lot of uh, uh, decision making becomes very, uh, I mean, you, you just look at it from a different perspective. Now, you have something so big to compare to. So, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, if you were earlier complaining about a hot day, uh, now I felt like, oh my God, I'm alive, you know, so I'm okay going through a hot day. So, um, I, I feel that was a big, big turning point in my life because um, it just made a lot of decision making seem very simple, you know, things that were seemingly difficult, oh my god, do I choose engineering or do I choose this one? I mean, it's okay, I'm alive, you know, so being alive was like the comparison to everything and it just puts, uh, you know, this, this big point perspective into your life. So uh, that way I felt it was a big turning point in my life, not just with respect to color company, but you know, with respect to everyday decisions. Uh, so yeah, I think that's beautiful. Cool. Thank you. Very vivid description there. Walk, walked us into your situation, actually took us, uh, you know, deep, deep underwater, if I may say. So what I'm picking up is we all don't need to actually be subjected to such a dramatic point in life. That happens to some people. Her story has it and I'm sure some other stories do have it. But actually it starts with a feeling of hollowness. In Hindi they say adhurapa. There's an incompleteness about your life. And if you, if you heal that sense of hollowness, you will find that you will be able to take a more informed decision about what you want to do with your life. This is not making me happy. This is making me feel incomplete. So what should I do about it? Now when you don't heed that, that stimuli that life is giving you, then a bigger, bigger challenge presents itself. I remember in 2005, Jan 1 at Kool, I, I told Vani that I don't want to go back to Chennai and I don't want to go to my office Whose office? Our office. Our own company. I don't want to go back to my company anymore. I just don't enjoy it. And she said, listen, you can quit somebody else's company. But you can't quit your own company. You're the boss. We are the people. We got to run this company. So that's where it's set in. But I don't think we took that point very seriously. Uh, I mean, we were struggling with it, but I don't think we, we got it completely right. And then the bankruptcy happened. The bigger upheaval happened. For her, it was the school of jellyfish. For us, it was a bankruptcy. But when you hit that point where you ask yourself deep searching questions, it's a beautiful time. Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with this? As Mary Oliver would say, what, tell me, what are you planning to do with this wild and precious life? That question getting asked is a very important turning point. And when you ask these questions, may not get answers immediately, but you will at least be pointed in the right direction. For you, Arti, I guess it happened with that time when you didn't think about your work, you thought about your art creating and what could have been. Right? But, but drawing that journey further, this incident happened in 2012. Yes. The color company first emerges on the horizon as a Facebook page in 2015. Yes. Now, up until the diving uh, program in, in the Athamans, you had stayed away from art after class 12, yeah. or art had not resurfaced in your life. But you think about art, 
and then it surfaces as, as the color company in 2015 as a Facebook page, right? So what happened in that time between 2012 and 2015 art series, did you seriously reconnect with art? How did it happen? So after after this this uh, this incident happened, uh, you know, I I obviously went back to to everyday life, you know, working and things like that. And uh, funnily, like like someone said, you know, after such a dramatic incident, maybe everyday life got in the way, you know. So paying your bills and you know just the humdrum of everyday life. So um, one thing that this incident did do was, uh, of course, you know, it, it leaves a lasting impact. So I, I made a conscious uh, uh, decision to to practice a little bit of art every day. So you did? Okay. So uh, it was not very regular. It was after I had my daughter. Uh, my daughter was born in 2013. So after that, um, uh, you know, I derived a lot of joy in, in making things for her. So she's almost never had any store-bought toys in the first couple of years. So. I would make the, you know, little things that would hang, hang on a cradle or, you know, make an origami cube for her to play with and things like that. So uh, that really kind of helped me reconnect with art, not in the traditional sense. So I was just sharing with Avis that I get a little nervous when people call me artist because I feel like people who have studied art, fine arts, uh, you know, they go through so much rigor and, you know, they... They they learn, they learn so much. Uh, that that's the traditional se you know sense of the word artist. Uh, but I've come to make my peace with it, and you know I um, I understand how art is art lies in the eyes of the beholder. So uh, I reconnected with art this way, you know, like by being a maker rather than doing your traditional paintings, etc. So uh, you know I slowly started reconnecting with with art, and also what happened was at that point in time. The, the Radhiwala who used to come home, the, the, the person uh, who would come to collect our waste, um, he stopped accepting glass bottles. So, uh, and being the holder that I am, I said, no, I'm not going to throw this away. I'll keep it and I'll find some use for it. And when glass bottles started stacking up at home, I, I searched for things to do on glass bottles. And obviously it had to do with paint because that's what I knew to do. And I just randomly started painting on bottles. And uh, it just kept accumulating and I was giving it away to people. So people who came home would like it or, uh, you know, I would give it away at, for someone's birthday and things like that. And uh, there was this one point in time where my then colleague asked for a customized bottle. She was like, hey, I, I want a picture of a Shiva painted on a bottle. Will you be able to do it for me? So I did it and gave it. And it was never meant to be a commercial arrangement, but she paid for it. And uh, uh, and that's that's one of the more expensive bottles I've sold off. I never put a price on it, but she paid for it. And uh, and and that's when that's when my belief uh, kind of started to grow that this could be a commercial proposition. So that process took a while. I mean, uh, so it took three years. That's because I think probably in year one and year two between 2012 and 15. Um, I, I didn't I didn't think of this as a commercial activity. I, I, I looked at it more as something that I would go to to for, for my for my peace and my sanity. Uh, and and it being commercial kind of evolved over the years. We'll, we'll come back to that, but I'm, I'm picking up a beautiful point here that when you lean in the direction of your uh, of your bliss. Uh, Rumi says this well, so I will, I, will, I will use Rumi here. He says, allow yourself to be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you love doing. It will never lead you astray. So there's a silent drawing. So it takes time, a couple of years. And there's a strange pull. Why would you want to pour bottles? Why would you want to tinker with them? Why do you, why do you want to paint with them? And why does it happen that a friend comes and says, can you do this for me? And even puts a financial value on it. That is what bliss does to you. It creeps in, it takes over your life, and it shapes you in a way that you can never imagine. Sitting right here with us, at the back, very quietly, is a bliss catcher himself, artist Toda Tarani, sir. Okay, an amazing guy. 
थोड़ा सर नमस्कार सो यू सेड यू डोंट लाइक टू बी यू नो यू नर्वस अबाउट बी कॉल्ड एन आर्टिस्ट एंड देयर इज द द द गुरु ऑफ देम ऑल सो आई सॉ यू कम एंड थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस सो लेट्स कंटिन्यू आई आई लाइक टू कम बैक टू योर स्टोरी आई हैव अ वेरी इंपोर्टेंट क्वेश्चन फॉर यू बट आई आई एम गोइंग टू गो टू ज्ञानेश्वर ज्ञानेश्वर टॉक अबाउट व्हाई आफ्टर योर बीएससी इन वाइल्ड लाइफ बायोलॉजी you you could have chosen research you could have done a masters gone abroad and got done a masters you could have done uh, probably a job right uh, why did you choose to do that job i mean i mean any other job right a corporate job but why did you choose uh, to work at the madras crocodile bank why uh, the madras crocodile bank uh, is there a story there uh, yes of course so just i but as soon as i finished my undergraduate in ut i was alongside working as a naturalist at one of the resorts in ooty so uh, until then i was so ambitious that i should do my masters right after my uh, bachelor so i applied to multiple colleges i got through some i couldn't get through others but what uh, that day what, i don't know what really it was but i just went for a hike all my myself i've been counting the hikes from the day when i joined there and i'm 94 not out yet Wow. So I went for the 94th time up to that hill, one of the biggest hills in the Indies. So I was just there sitting and watching cricket, and then I suddenly realized, why should I do my ma- masters, or why should I do that? Why don't I spend a year in understanding what I should be doing in future, and let's work on building up my own ability. So I then went about searching for part-time jobs or interns, ev- internships everywhere, and then. Um, and then uh, i was still searching and then i had to go out of new greece and i went back to home bysack i just came back from a very cold place to very hot place and i had a huge health problem i was dehydrated i was feeling feverish and all so then i realized that there's a small internship opening up at the address crocodile bank and then uh, i was a little bit excited because i wanted to get that and then uh, later on after a few days uh i went to a small restaurant to meet some of the friends who came all the way from bangalore to catch some snakes in paisa so we just having a regular interaction and uh, there was mat that i was really looking looking to meet for last 3 years i've been coming to chennai since 2012 and every time i used to come i used to go to the madras crocodile bank it was it was like a place where we go and we watch reptiles and we learn from it So every time I go there, I had to meet this one person called as Romulus Whitaker. And every time I go there, I couldn't meet him because he's busy, he's always traveling and all. So uh, I couldn't meet him. But then at this day in restaurant, in Vizag, in Vizag, in Vizag, I was sitting at a restaurant in Vizag and I was talking to a couple of friends, and they were telling me about their experience in Vizag. Suddenly, from a back comes this American accent saying, "Hey man, what's up?" I was like. who is this man and i turned back and there was rom sitting right behind me and uh, telling me that uh, we had a great run and we were looking forward for more other stuff happening there so i was so i was so suddenly it was a uh, adrenaline rush because i just recovered from a fever and then suddenly the blood pressure increased in such a way that i think i got fever again <laughs> so i was right behind and i was like i i i couldn't i didn't know what to talk i always had a speech ready whenever i wanted to meet him but right there i didn't know what to talk and i was high and said everything and we had a conversation so that at that moment of time i thought that he would explain the situation of a snake bite scenario in india and i was really moved and i thought that as i started as a kid to save snakes and now people are being killed by snakes so there is something a big connection in between if you are able to tell people that snakes if you are able to make people aware that you can avoid snake but still start conserve snakes so with that motto in mind i again uh, went back to uh, a crocodile bank and i actually i got my internship so here the main reason for me to stay one is romulus whitaker second reason for me is my current boss ajay karthik so he is one of those people whom i used to idolize ever since i started understanding this wildlife and all i used to look at his facebook posts i used to think he's so cool and all and on the day of internship when i realized that okay he'll be a boss i was so excited i was like okay this is so fun this is going to be so fun i didn't expect this but this is going to be so fun so i ended up starting like uh, internship at madras crocodile bank and i started 
working and three months down the line they were ready to offer me a job so on my birthday i got a job to work at madras capital bank as an assistant coordinator for one of the best projects in the world snake bite project fantastic fantastic all of course all of course i you know i i just want to ask you 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 grow up idolizing romulus vitekus okay who doesn't idolize him and then he presents himself after three failed attempts of yours he presents himself in front of you like why is that now, what are the chances that's the power of this entire idea of following you this and now you are working with ajay karthik a person that you again idolize and you are it's like playing with ms dhoni right you you're playing with ms dhoni you're hanging out with sachin tendulkar that's what is happening in your life except that it's happening in a different space in wildlife and conservation and snakes and all of that amazing amazing what i uh, what i'm actually also understanding from your from your journey is that um, and, and let me ask you this as a question and let me see your answer and then tell you what i may probably be taking away why is it that your life is so 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 interesting okay one there is a snake killing episode that awakens your sense of purpose that you got to do something about it two every person that walks into your life after that is pointing you to bsc wildlife uh, biology and moves you away from medical school okay and then all your life you want to meet romulus whitaker and then he taps you on the shoulder literally from behind and says hey man what's happening so do you think that um, everything happens for a reason in life do you think that there are no coincidences what's your what's your take on this uh that to say but yeah, i think everything happens for a reason i didn't plan on any of these things so when i planned it didn't work out but when i didn't plan on when i started walking on i just went on my own journey searching for something else i started th- getting things that i really wanted so when i thought that i'll just meeting i'll be just meeting this person to talk about abundance of one specific snake there was wrong there when i thought that i'll be working with bears just to be in their grills i met this person who said go to ooty and do this so i think uh, the reason why it was interesting was because i didn't try to make it interesting i just just kept uh, going whatever is possible just walked in wherever i can and started meeting people that was one of the biggest thing that i always recall to that i i had the chance to meet one of the good people in the conservation field who always motivated who was still motivating me in getting things done or get for me to go to a better position that's amazing i i didn't i didn't work towards making it interesting i just walked and it turned out to be interesting that is that is you know a, a very powerful answer there because in a way if you look at it we think we control our life and our experience what what i've learned um, you know if you had met me 15 years ago i would have been probably telling you have a have a vision have a set of goals have everything written down to the last detail and make sure it works okay even today i have things written down okay very clearly about how uh, things should go but then there's a big shift you have a plan but trust the master plan the master plan i realized has no flaws so whatever comes your way accept it and many a time what you want romulus whitaker wants you to that's why he presents himself at wise act what you want will come under water and remind you that hey this is what you should be doing in your life what are you doing in that 15 hour a day corporate job that was the reminder service from the universe to you so rumi says this very beautifully he says what you want is wanting you to what you're seeking is seeking you to and so the master plan has no flaws things are happening according to a beautiful grand design which makes a young boy from wisai become our youngest bliss catcher this evening to be seated here to tell us this fascinating story thank you thank you so let me go back to our piece story here i'm watching the time so just be easy uh, so my question to you is it's so easy especially for you know to use your own words an untrained artist okay Uh, who didn't go to art school or anything like that to just be lost in this whole thing uh, of following art doing art and being it being a hobby 
any specific incident that happened in your life that told you that no, this is your bliss and this is not just a hobby. Uh, there's a big difference when you're working elsewhere and also dabbling a, a few hours to just take your mind off your daily stresses. That's a hobby. But when something draws you to it again and again and again, it is your bliss. So my question is, how did you understand that art is your bliss? Um, so I think, uh, you know, through the three years between the incident and me putting up a hobby page, um, I think everybody at, at home, my family, my husband, all of, all of them knew that uh, I was very drawn to this. So in, in 2015, when I when I put up my Facebook page uh, and you know when I was talking about where it should go with my husband uh, Kailash, um, so he said, uh, you know, why don't you try and make this commercial? Because I was very torn between. Uh, so I everything at, I, at my work life was going very great. I had a, I had no complaints. I had like a great job. And, I had a great boss, I had a great, uh, I mean, a very flexible company. As a young mother, you know, they offered me a lot of flexibility on, on time and, and, you know, uh, work hours and things like that. I, I had nothing to complain about. I had, I had, I felt like I had the best of, you know, uh, the corporate world that one could ask for. And, uh, but here, you know, I, I found a lot of joy in doing this. So I wanted to, I wanted to basically spend more time doing it. So when I was very torn about, uh, you know, um, being able to find time to do this, and I wanted to do it more often, uh, my husband urged me to think, think commercially about it. You know, so I, I had all of those fears about not being an artist, uh, you know, being a very YouTube learner, so to say, and things like that. And you know, in in the creative uh, space, you, you tend to get lost in the creativity more than anything else. So anything good comes, you know, anything creative comes your way, you want an opportunity to work on it, you want to be able to showcase something beautiful. Uh, but thanks to thanks to a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, influence from, from the management training that I had, and my husband is a marketing specialist, so he keeps, he's like my reality check uh, kind of thing, so he keeps pulling me up every time uh, uh, you know he feels like I'm, I'm going to astray with the whole creative flow uh, so it was it was only after a lot of his persuasion that that I was able to uh, think of this on a commercial basis till then it, it was more like you know uh, I, I think it's more of a virtue that I wanted to uh, you know carry with me saying that creativity and commercialization of creativity don't go together. But I think it was through his gentle persuasion that I saw that there is a way that both can be uh, linked together. So, and at that point in time, I felt like I found my bliss because my worries about, you know, being able to pay my bills at the end of the month was slowly, I mean, it was not gone away, but slowly somewhere beginning to get answered. I was able to, I was able to create a plan. I was able to put some numbers to what I could expect in my bank balance at the end of the month. So uh, when things like that happen, and you know when when your when your passion meets uh, a, a point where you're not worried about you know very very existential things anymore, then I felt like I was in that bliss zen zone kind of thing. So uh, I think it was that gentle persuasion about him pushing me to think of it from a very commercial aspect that helped me find my bliss. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting take. Uh, to me. Bliss is the point where you lose yourself, there is complete immersion, and I think you, you have pretty much reached that point, but you know the insecurities of everyday living can come back and literally gnaw at your heels, right, they, they chew you up there, saying, oh my god, do you think I'm ready for this, what, what if it doesn't make money, and there I think Kailash, your husband, uh, held your hand and help you structure it. I'm reminded of what uh, another bliss catcher, Anjali Venkat, who was with us uh, in the season opener in January, said. She said it's a great blessing if your gift, your art, your, your, your bliss, your gift, is both a source of earning a living and also gives you joy. That's what Anjali said. So it's very powerful that you and Kailash were able to uh, bring these two circles together. 
which is the circle of joy and the circle of economic security. So I'm glad, I, and there that's when you realize that we won't do this full time. Amazing, fantastic. Um, let me go to Yaneshwar for my next question, which is pre pretty much related, but you're much younger. So I'll ask it, uh, in a diff and I assume you're single. Okay. So today, today, conservation enthusiast Yaneshwar is single uh, uh, at the moment. Okay, uh, and um, it's fine uh, to say wildlife, crime control, um, understanding the world of snakes, uh, working with brown bitaker. All of these are very, very uh, great motivators to do what you're doing. Uh, and, and that sense of purpose, I'm not denying that. But what if somebody comes into your life, a companion tomorrow? Uh, what about peer pressure, your classmates uh, flying abroad, uh, earning much, much more money? Do these things come and distort your view of what you're trying to do? How do you stay anchored? Uh, it, it doesn't distort me as of, but it will, it will keep it will give me a reason to work on a better note. So, for example, if I in future if I have a companion that I need to uh, 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 be with. So, so, just now on the Biscatcher show, you said that you don't have a companion. Just kidding. Okay, go ahead. Hopefully, none of my exes are watched. So, uh, so I think I have to adapt to that. It, it's like you have to work on visually. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough call to take. But uh, yeah, lots of times friends also ask like, why are you doing this? Is this for real what you're doing? And when I explain them what I am doing and, and, and I show them some cool pictures, they're all amazed. Like, how do you do this? So maybe at this point of stage, everybody will be amazed. But uh, in a future run, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it continues to be the same, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, it's more about working more into the industry and when you keep working more into the industry, both money and happiness will be on the same line. So maybe not uh, uh, maybe not so uh, so much like what my friends are who are currently doing their uh, doing in engineering or doctors. Maybe I, I may not be able to meet them economically, but I'm sure that I'll be able to meet them at a at a at a social responsibility kind. So I, I'm I'm able to reach them at that kind of level. But uh, yeah, it kind of distorts me sometimes when they tell when they tell that we're going on a vacation to there and uh, and, you, that, yeah. and you can't and you can't and it. yeah. But I show them pictures from India where I went there and I. Even now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is an important point. It, I'm glad you said, Nyaneshwar, that you do get disturbed, you do get swayed, and we will all get swayed. You cannot have uh, a situation where you will not have worldly influences coming and clouding your thinking or making you review your decisions. But your sense of purpose will always give you that anchor, right? So. Uh, when you when you wake up the next morning and you go on to do what you do and you, you love doing it, whether it's hard art or whether it's your uh, conservation efforts, uh, the joy you get is unparalleled. Would I be right? Right. Yeah. So here's the here's the big uh, lesson for all of us. We have two ways of living our life. The whole world is trying to become something. The whole world is trying to become something. And you have an option of just being. That's why we are not called human becomings. We are called human beings. Please understand. There's a big difference between being and becoming. In the being paradigm, you have to do what you have to do. She has to get up in the morning. She has to do her art. He has to do his conservation efforts. I have to do my writing. I have to do my speaking. We have to do our workshops. We have to do what we have to do. And just be. Enjoy the process. And life will take care of us. Not the way we want it. You know, I wish I had more money. I wish everyone here will have, say that I wish we had more money. But life will take care of us. That's the being paradigm. You know what the becoming paradigm does? It makes you do everything. But brings in an expectation that because I did this, I must become that. And the moment the expectation comes, it ruins the party. So expectations will arise. But you know, the evolved mind 
we'll pick up an expectation and say, hey, this is a distraction, let me leave it aside. So let me send my friends a picture from this cancer show saying, you know, at age 21, at, at an important point in my life, I featured in this cancer show. That's my high for today. Tomorrow, the other day he sent me an anaconda, a baby anaconda picture. He said, a gift for you. Boom. You know? And that was that was his his moment of joy. And that he was sharing it with me. She does the decoupage and she shares it with her uh, students in her class, in a workshop, her delegates in a workshop. And that's her moment of joy when, when Avani walks in home and says, look dad, what I created. That's because of what she was able to do. So I think we all have our opportunities to be, and those opportunities will manifest themselves more if we stop trying to become something. So drop the becoming, just be. So I'm going to ask you, um, actually, we are out of time. So if I have time, I'll come back for one last question to the two of you. But right now, it's time for questions for the audience. So. Uh, four questions coming your way back to back with we short on time so you have to really answer these questions quickly and grab your mugs uh, my first question is on Aarti this is a sitter and I will strongly encourage Ramesh and Geeta not to answer this question Geeta and Marichandra not to answer this question this uh, particular institution taught Aarti a very important lesson but she will not want necessarily to go back to the school which school are we referring to? I, I heard it there first. You are, raised your hand, but I heard it there. Yes, yes. The school of jellyfish, please come forward. I give it to her. Okay. Aarti again. Such a powerful lesson. What's your name? Kritika. Thank you. Thank you, Kritika. Enjoy your coffee tomorrow morning. Okay. So, I'm sorry, Joel. Uh, the good old days when Siddharth Basu used to do quizzes, he would say quiz master's decision is final. <laughs> so, you know, so Avis's decision is final. Please bear with me. Okay. Uh, the next question is on Nyaneshwar. And let me think up the question that I thought of on Nyaneshwar. Um, uh, ha, yes. This is open to everyone, but you have to be quick because somebody else may get it ahead of you. Connect Nyaneshwar with the Padma Shri winner. Romulus Vitekar. Romulus Vitekar, we'll give it to you. We'll give it to Rom Romulus Vitekar. Yes, it is. So many cups to is, he, is he from Madras Club, Mike? No, he's not. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. It is Romulus Vitekar. He got the uh, Padma Shri in 2018. I think he deserves much more, but uh, I'm sure he doesn't mind. <laughs> he doesn't bother about it at all. <laughs> so, so, but, but one Padma Shri that we can all truly be proud of, Romulus Vitekar. So thank you for that. Now we go to the two special uh, questions for the ODC 24, uh, for the 24th birthday of ODC. Okay, two special questions, and these are not related to my guests. So these are on um, on our city because ODC is part of Chennai. So these are on our city. Uh, anybody can go for them. I will I will give you a sentence which will have two blanks in it. Please fill in the blanks. It's a sitter, okay? Uh, and those who have already got mugs, please hold. <laughs> Let the others get a chance. If nobody answers, in the first 30 seconds, you can spring up, okay? The Dash brothers lost their Dash. Amritraj brothers lost their mother. Amritraj brothers lost their mother. I'll give it to Rajana. <laughs> <laughs> the Amritraj brothers lost their mother. Do we know the name of the mother? Maggie. Maggie, Maggie yes. yes. Maggie, I'll give it to myself. Is Ashwin here? No. Okay, I'll give it to myself. Thank you, Ranjana. Yes. The Amritraj brothers lost their mother. Okay. Maggie Amritraj. So that was the first question. Odyssey's 24th birthday. And the last question for the evening. Uh, again, celebrating Odyssey's 24th birthday. And this question is a cryptic question. So you've got to answer... The answer is the name of a person. Okay? Uh, Gita, please don't answer. <laughs> if nobody answers, I look at you and I say, Gita, please answer. <laughs> because you will know this answer. That's why I'm saying. 
uh, Ramesh, you also hold on for a second. Okay. 973 columns, 20 years. Yes, absolutely. I heard you say it. Radha, come, come, come. Yes, you come and you take a mug and you go away and don't come for some time. So, <laughs> I remember you or Usha won a mug the last time you were yes. here. Yes. Okay. So, yes, 973 columns, 20 years on the trot without missing a single deadline. Okay. S. Mutaya, who passed away last week. Amazing uh, gentleman. He taught me journalism, my guru in journalism, and uh, also taught me what his idea of happiness is. Uh, something that I relish. So, thank you so much uh, for no, your answers. Two questions. They are supposed to ask. Format changed. Format changed. We keep reinventing. Okay, don't worry. So, we had to throw in extra questions this time as well. So, I, I led all the questions. So, be prepared for more changes. So, fantastic conversation here. I'm going to do a wrap uh, and close the conversation. Uh, but before that, uh, is Ashwin here? Okay, but then we'll, we'll carry on. Uh, we'll carry on. Why don't you come forward? And why don't we give away your coveted Viscatcher trophies for both of you? So, for both of you, Arti, this is for you. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. You pick up your cover. Yes. Thank you, Nyaneshwar, our youngest Viscatcher ever. What a fascinating story both of you have to share with me. Thank you so much. You know, I was, I was, as you were answering the quiz questions, I was actually trying to piece the entire conversation together. And uh, something very powerful struck me, which is that um, in, in life, what happens in life is that we're often told something is sinful, something is bad, and all of that. You know, I think the most sinful thing in life is a lost life. A lost life. I'm just recovering from a situation where uh, I lost my father uh, about two weeks ago and uh, he was a man who who could have been, he is a phenomenal musician and he could have been very very successful had he followed his bliss uh, but he did not. And therefore I was telling Vani that in those days, if we had had the opportunity to sit with dad and talk to him about his bliss, uh, maybe his life would have been very different. So, to me, the most sinful aspect of life is a lost life. When uh, and, and we don't die because death takes us away. We die minute by minute, day by day, by not doing what we love doing. By uh, delaying, by postponing happiness we die. And by not giving what we love doing, by not giving it our time, our heart, we die. Our two friends here this evening, Arti and Yaneshwar, through choices they made in their life, have demonstrated the power of living free. Both of them, through interesting experiences, one came to near death, and the other saw another species being killed. And both of them rose up, awakened from their lives to live their life very differently. She chose to be an artist, go back to her art, allowed herself to be drawn silently by the strange pull of what she loves doing. And Yaneshwar decided to do not medicine, but conservation and moved in that direction, living a life of purpose. So that's what I'm picking up from both of you. Thank you so much for being who you are and for being on this show. Uh, it's been fascinating having you both here. Uh, so here are a couple of announcements as I uh, close the session. Uh, we are not doing any conversations in the month of May and June. Uh, we, in July, this is the schedule we have. On the 13th of July, we have the Happiness Conversations happening at the Madras Literary Society on 13th July, Saturday at 10.30 a.m. It's, it's, it's 
a mid-morning session going on to 12.30. It's a two-hour session. And our guest is Sundari Sivasumpu, who is celebrating life with uh, a cerebral palsy. So she is on a wheelchair, and we cannot get her on a wheelchair to this venue. So Madras Literary Society is co-sponsoring this event, and so we're moving the event there. That's on 13th July. On 27th July, we have uh, Miss Catchers here again. The last Saturday, we'll be back here at 7 p.m. Uh, and we have two wonderful guests, uh, an artist who calls himself Ayane Kadal. Elephants are his inspiration. Kartikeyam, Pichai Maria, I'm sorry with the last name, but Kartikeyan is his name. And uh, the, other, the other guest is Harish Srinivasan, who uh, is uh, an engineer who decided not to go into a corporate role and instead set up Infinite Engineers, an organization that goes to schools and makes science fun for kids. So Harish and Kartikeyan will be with us uh, on 27th July at 7 p.m. here for Bliss Catchers. And of course, in August, we have uh, Bliss Catchers on 31st August, and that's the 50th edition of Bliss Catchers. So if you would like to be on, on our mailing list, please leave your name and number with Vani or me, and we will, we will keep sending you updates. Thank you, Arti. Thank you, Yanishwar. It has been wonderful having you here.